Good morning. We will not be starting our service just yet, but we will start as soon as a vehicle that is currently running in the parking lot is uh, turned off. I think it's been left running. If you have a uh, Honda CRV with the license plate TLL8127, um, we won't start without you, but your car is currently started and running. So please uh, take care of that. Um, but thank you. We'll start our service pretty soon. Well, good morning, everyone. We are glad that you've joined us this morning. I want to applaud you all for being on time to a service that started 15 minutes earlier. Good job. And um, I, if I haven't met you, I am Laura, and I'm a ministry partner here. And I'm Luke, and we are so grateful that you are here with us this morning. We want to extend an extra special welcome, get, uh, welcome to you if you're a first-time guest. But wherever you are in your journey... Um, you are welcome here. We, um, man, I'm really not doing this right. 
Okay, I'm so sorry. So Lake Forest is a church for skeptics of faith, for those who are exploring what it looks like to follow Jesus, and for those who have been following Jesus for a long time. But wherever you are in your journey, you are welcome here. Yes, and um, one of the best ways for you to get to know more about who us and who we are is through our welcome guide. It's in the seat pocket in front of you, and that will tell you a, a lot of information about who we are. And then there's another uh, item in that pocket. It's a connection card. And the connection card is a way for you to tell us about you so that we can get to know you better. Um, and it's a way for you to indicate if you want to get connected here at the church, um, if you have a prayer request, if you just have a question. Um, that is a perfect way for you to submit any of those things to us. And you can put them in the brown boxes on your way out or leave them at the info table. Yes, you'll also notice in the welcome guide, there is information about Missio Dei, which means mission of God. And here at Lake Forest, we place high value on each one of our role in the mission of God here in the world. Yeah, and one of those um, specific opportunities that we focus on for our Missio Day is um, the Lake Forest Shares Program. And that is a team of incredible volunteers. They come together every single week to sort food and share food with neighbors who are in need. Um, but the, the really cool thing about this opportunity is it's not just about the food. It's really about relationships. It is about good neighboring and, and forming friendships with these families. And our volunteers form long-lasting relationships with these families each week as they come together with them. Yes, and we all have an opportunity to help support the Lake Forest Shares team uh, by bringing Christmas gifts and extras when holidays occur over the next year. So we'll make an announcement about that when there are opportunities in the future. So as you notice, we're starting at 9.15 today in preparation for making more room for folks who are coming in. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand as you're able. And when you do so, if you will scoot in towards the center of your row to help create seats for folks who are coming in. And we want to do that to ensure that we have space for those who are coming in before we utilize the overflow room. So if you would stand and turn and greet someone around you today. Church, let's sing this together. We lift our hands to the heavens. We are here for you. We reach for the hem of your garment. We know what it can do. We know what it can do. We refuse. We refuse to go through the motions. When the King is in the room, hear the sound. Let it build a throne for you. Let it build a throne for you. Let everything that has breath praise, praise. Let everything that has breath praise, praise. Let everything that has breath sing a new song to the Lord. Oh, let 
without your love a slave to the darkness and if it wasn't for the cross you have won me with your kindness and chased me down when I was lost, where would I be if it wasn't for the cross? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. Because with your blood, you all my freedom hallelujah for the cross and all my shame was met with mercy and now your mercy will be my song and all oh, the glory and all oh, the power of the cross yeah and hallelujah thank you Jesus I was a prisoner now I'm not oh cause with your blood be seated. Well, friends, today is a great day to come to worship. 
Um, not only because we get a chance to sing uh, the worship songs, but we're going to hear a wonderful message. But today it's a wonderful day because we're also celebrating baptism together as a congregation. And I think it's an extra special day because today a father and daughter are going to be baptized here up here. So I'm going to invite right now uh, Harper and John, if you come up on stage. And, yeah. Well, baptism is a sacrament that we uh, celebrate together as a congregation. It's a sign and seal of God's work that he did through Jesus Christ, his death on the cross to bring us new life. And we got to talk about that together, didn't we? Uh, one of the beautiful things about baptism is there's, there's beautiful pictures and symbols right in the act of baptism. We see the water and we see that cleansing, forgiving work that Jesus did for us and for our sins. We also, we do this as a congregation because it's, a, it's an acknowledgement that you are part of God's people. You are one of his. You're part of this, this group here. But also we celebrate this beautiful act of going into the water. And it's a picture of us dying to our sin. And when you come out of that water, it's a picture of that new life that we have in Jesus Christ. And that's why when that happens, the congregation erupts with applause because we're celebrating a new life in Jesus Christ. So that's baptism, and um, Harper, you've been waiting for this for a little while, haven't you? You've been so excited. You told me that, I, I think it was this past summer, you were at camp, and you heard the message of, of, of Jesus, and you placed your faith and trust in him. And since that time, you've been saying, I want to get baptized, and so we're so glad to have you here. Now, what's interesting, Harper, about your story is that your story also impacts your dad's story. He talked about in his God story in Welcome 101 not that long ago how your decision was also made an impact on him. And John, you're going to tell us a little bit about your story. You said you'd be willing to do that today. Uh, you grew up in faith as a child, um, but you said that there was a time of aimless wandering where, you know, just kind of faith, you know, for the family and for your life just kind of took second place, was back shelf. And then we'd love to hear how, what God did in the process of that uh, and part of your story this morning. So uh, picking up from there, um, uh, me and my wife, when we first met, we were both in similar places in our lives. Um, after three short months, we were married, and we moved around from my job, and I became heavily focused on my career. We talked about faith occasionally and testing out a couple of different churches, but none of them really hit home with us. Four years into our marriage, we had our daughter, and then life really got busy. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> We focused on what was best for her, and for us, that meant doubling down on career goals to provide the best opportunities. During this time, faith was not a priority, but I felt something was missing. I had a lot of questions. I was a skeptic, but I was also curious to understand what my overall purpose was. I had an overwhelming desire to be more than just a career-driven father and husband, but I had no clue how or where to focus those efforts. At this point, I'm emotionally and spiritually exhausted. So my God story does not have one light bulb moment, but rather a series of things that helped me realize what I was missing. The first came when my parents uh, joined a church and made faith a priority. My sister invited me to attend church with her, and it didn't take long to realize that worship was something I needed. And last summer, while Harper attended a week-long Bible camp, she decided to dedicate her life to Christ. <clears throat> Next, we moved to Denver, and this last August, and decided to look for a church, and my wife found Lake Forest, and when we were immediately uh, felt welcome here. Over Christmas break, there were a couple more meaningful impacts. First, my wife, Laurel, gave me a daily devotional so that we could do them together, hmm. and Christmas Day, my parents gifted me with my very first Bible. Amen. So at that moment, I realized that God had been waiting for me this entire time, and each one of those previously mentioned experiences was the, was the evidence I needed. And for all those reasons, I understand that through the grace of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, I have been reconciled to God and given eternal life. I have accepted, accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior by faith. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, Harper, John, you answer these questions to, about faith uh, with us. But we do this as a congregation. You're going to also affirm your faith in Jesus Christ to the congregation so they can be part of this. And they're going to actually bring covenant questions to you as well. So here are these questions, and afterwards you're going to answer, I do. First question is, do you acknowledge that you are sinners in the sight of God and in need of his mercy and grace? Do you? I do. 
And do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and, repeat and depend upon him alone for your salvation? Do you? I do. I do. <laughs> and finally, do you commit today to follow Jesus as the Lord and leader of your life, trusting his grace and the Holy Spirit to empower you in this life of faith? Do you? I do. I do. There you go. Well, congregation, we make promises back to John and Harper. Would you at this time, would you be willing to stand? And we're going to, I'm going to ask you two questions. And at the close of those questions, if you affirm this, would you, we're going to say we do together. So congregation, do you, as members of this congregation, in the name of the visible church of the Lord Jesus Christ, assume responsibility for the continued Christian nurture of Harper and John? And do you commit yourself to be a godly example by your life? to encourage them in their own growth in the character of Jesus and to pray for Harper and John in this new life of faith. Do you? Yeah. You do. Amen. Oh, okay, I'm going to take this because you're going to go down to the tank at this time. And Harper's going to go first today. Um, are you going to have a seat? Many times I was in that tank where it was pretty cold, and so you notice that I'm up here today. Uh, <laughs> I figured it out. And so, uh, we're so excited for you, Harper, today, and uh, we see your excitement, too, and we're so grateful for what God's doing. Okay, Harper K. Marsh, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Woo! Amen! Amen! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for bringing your joy with us to us with this morning, Harper. We're so blessed. I had to have season in the tank for this guy. And, and, and Angie is one of um, Harper's Kid Venture leaders, and so it's excited to have that. So, John David Marsh, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 Thank you. Would you guys pray with me at this time? Lord Jesus, thank you for the precious gift of baptism where we can publicly declare our love and passion for you, Lord. We ask for your goodness and your blessing to be poured out on these, your faithful servants, Harper and John. We pray that you would work deeply within their hearts and souls to renew and refresh them each day. And do this work in each of us as well through your Holy Spirit as you lead and guide us. And we pray this in the short, a strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Let's stand and sing together once again. Just as baptism is a symbol we have to admit to following Jesus, to show that we have made this choice. Worship can be that for us too. So we're going to sing a song that speaks to that. Let my life be worship. This moment is holy, and I hear you calling. I turn my face towards you. My heart is open You're always pursuing And my life surrendered You have my affection together So let my life be
blessing and sorrow. In blessing, in sorrow, in the ordinary, whatever the cost is, you're always worthy. My heart's cry, my whole life is for. themselves down in baptism as a way to say yes, as a way to say yes, I will follow. Would you tap us on the shoulder? Would you encourage us too to follow? Would you let our lives be worship? And it's in your name we pray. Can we say amen together? Amen. Well, there we go. <laughs> Good morning, church. My name is Aaron. I'm lead pastor here at Lake Forest. And uh, let me just name something that I saw. John and Harper, y'all are back. 
I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of your courage to take that step of faith and trust in Jesus. And Harper, what we all got to see is that God has given you the spiritual gift of encouragement. And it is amazing. And would that everyone had a Harper in their life, right? Don't you want a Harper kind of friend in your life? Awesome. We are so proud of y'all. So proud. Let's start this way. One of my friends in high school uh, worked for a fast food chain. Uh, I can't tell you which one, but let's just say they're known for having meats. In fact, you might say they have the meats. I really liked this restaurant in high school. I loved eating there. But then all of that changed one day when my friend described in great detail (laughs) what it was like to cut open the large 20-pound hermetically sealed bag of gelatinous orange brownish meat product. He described the suction sound as it was extracted from the bag. And, well, let's just say I was forever ruined. I was forever ruined. I don't think I have ever eaten at that restaurant again. (laughs) In a way, I think this is analogous. This is similar to how many experience faith and the church today. This last Christmas, I was talking with a friend of mine who had been in youth ministry for many, many years. Uh, But his experience of the church, of moral failure and some of the leadership, someone who had been a mentor to him, and his own church hurt had left him feeling quite disillusioned. In his words, he said, Aaron, I'm good with Jesus. I just think I'm done with church. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you've had a similar experience. Truth is, we're living in a time of eroding trust and growing disillusionment with the church in the U.S., and especially with Christianity in general. When we read about the Catholic abuse scandals or celebrity pastors falling, the mishandling of money, or even some of the theological shifts that leave us feeling like our church left us, all of this together can give us a feeling like giving up or even at times questioning the validity of our own faith especially when it feels like the church that we loved or that so impacted us personally has let us down. As John Tyson, a pastor from New York City, has said, we are living in what feels like a crisis of trust and credibility for the church. And honestly, at times, I don't know what to do with that. I really don't. Uh, We are in the series looking at the Uh, letter to the Thessalonians. I'm going to say a bit about that in a minute, but today as we get started, this is this is going to be a bit of a challenging talk for us today. This is not an easy talk to give. Uh, We planned this series six months ago to go through Thessalonians, and uh, it it is really speaking to us. Today as we jump into chapter two, I want to suggest two things. First, that this is not a new challenge for the church. We're going to see that in this letter to the Thessalonians. But secondly, I hope to end today with some hope. That there's actually something we can do to help. There's something we can do to be a part of writing a different kind of story. So that's where we're headed. Last week we started this series called Living in the Middle. And you might ask, Aaron, in the middle of what? Well, uh, what Christians believe and have believed for the last 2,000 years is that we are living between two resurrections. The first resurrection we celebrated two weeks ago. That was the resurrection of Jesus after he had been crucified. Three days later, God raised him from the dead. That's what we celebrated Easter. And that's truly amazing. That's the first resurrection. But the first resurrection is also a promise. It's a guarantee pointing forward to the second resurrection. The day when Jesus will return to restore and renew all of his creation. And we're promised that those who are in Christ will also be raised to live forever in this new earth and new heavens. And y'all, I don't know that about you, but that sounds pretty awesome to me. But in the meantime, in between these two resurrections, we still live in a broken world with broken people and broken institutions, and we are among them. <laughs> and how are we to live in the middle of all of that? What does faithfulness to Jesus look like in that kind of broken world, especially when that brokenness is experienced inside the church? 
Well, that's what the letter to the Thessalonians was written to address. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul just 17 years after the resurrection of Jesus. This is, the old, we believe, the oldest letter in all of the New Testament. And it was written to encourage these Christians in Thessalonica on how to live in the middle of a broken world as faithful followers of Jesus. We planned this out six months ago on our teaching team teaching team felt like it would be good to preach through the entire letter. We, we like to do this a couple times a year. And so we're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, to see what encouragement God might have for us as we live in the middle. Last week, we looked at chapter one. We talked about Paul's language of mimics and models. If you remember this, mimics and models, we are all imitating someone. We asked, who am I imitating? We're all imitating someone. Who am I imitating? But Paul reminds us that we're called first to be imitators of Jesus and of other men and women who are faithfully following him. But just as we are all imitating someone, someone is also imitating us. We're called to be models to others of what faithfulness looks like. And so as we come to chapter 2, Paul is going to pick up this topic and talk about not only what faithful leadership looks like, but also how we can be a part of helping to restore and rebuild trust and credibility to the gospel through our own leadership in our community, our workplaces, our schools, even our families. That's where we're headed. Are we getting a feel for what we're doing? So let me read this to you. This is the first 12 verses of chapter 2. You can follow along. We'll have it on the screens. By the way, we have reading guides during this series if you'd like to pick one up after the service in the lobby. Chapter 2, verse 1, Paul begins this way. He says, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with his gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. He continues, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. All right. We got a lot of ground to cover today. With your permission, I just want to do a little teaching. Is that all right? We're going to kind of teach today. Uh, Paul and Silas, let me give you some background here. Paul and Silas had been totally mistreated in the city of Philippi. That's where they were before coming to Thessalonica. There they were beaten, arrested, chased out of town for their teaching about Jesus, and they come to Thessalonica expecting the same treatment. But the number of people that respond to their message is so great. This is so crazy. It's so big that the local religious leaders, particularly the Jewish leaders, get jealous. You can actually read about this in Acts chapter 17. Eventually, it gets so bad that Paul and Silas have to flee. They're chased out of town. We talked about that a little bit last week. The civil authorities and the Jewish leaders in Thessalonica are accusing Paul of being no different than these other self-centered leaders in his day. See, what you have to understand is that in this day, the common practice of traveling spiritual or philosophical teachers was this. They would come into a town, they would set up shop, they would charge for you to come and listen to their speaking. And you can check the fact, the history books on this, fact check this. They were also known for sleeping around with a lot of women. That's just kind of what they did. They would come to town, get the money, get the women, and then as soon as they were ready to uh, be kind of tarred and feathered, they would sneak out of town at night, they'd go to the next city, and they would just wash, rinse, and repeat. This was just the day and age in which they lived. And so these jealous leaders decide to accuse Paul of the same thing. 
As we come to chapter 2, and this is just remarkable, Paul is going to respond to these accusations. And he's going to do so by countering what they're saying. He's going to do so by giving an account to his own leadership. The New Testament scholar Leon Morris points out that what we are given here is a model picture of a Christian leader's integrity. More specifically, he says we see three things. We see first, the leader's motive. Secondly, the leader's methods. And third and finally, the leader's mission. Motives, methods, missions. Look at that. They all begin with the same letter. Awesome. All right. So here we go. I said we're teaching. I said we're teaching. Let's, let's cr- crunch through these. First, a leader's motives. Look at me at verse 3. Paul says this. For the appeal we make does not spring from error, or here it is, impure motives. Nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. Paul starts with this reminder of his motives. He says, remember, you remember, you saw me. My motives were pure. And he appeals to his own character. That is, he wasn't out for financial gain or to try and please people. On the contrary, he says he was seeking to please God. In fact, one of the most striking things about the ministry of Paul, and we see this throughout the whole of the New Testament, is that Paul is constantly putting himself in harm's way for the sake of the gospel. And this is what he does coming to Thessalonica. He puts himself in harm's way in order to share the message of Jesus' death and resurrection. Not only did he refuse to take anything from them, We actually learn that Paul worked with his own hands to provide for his own needs. He did not appeal to his position as an apostle in any way to be advantaged, but he humbled himself over and over and over again for the sake of others. It's such a remarkable picture of leadership and such a contrast to leadership in our world today. Most leaders, and especially in social media realms, seem to be all about pleasing people, all about gaining followers, about building their own brand. And one of the great challenges is that when, in our culture, we elevate somebody because of their giftedness instead of their character, we set them up for failure. Our character must always be the foundation. Our character must always be broader than our giftedness. When our giftedness becomes bigger than our character, we become unstable. And we almost always know how that story ends. Character is the foundation. This is why John Stott, the theologian, writes that for the Christian leader, there is no trait more fundamental than a God-centeredness and Godward orientation when it comes to our motives in ministry. Eugene Peterson calls this living for an audience of one, for the approval of one. And this is a question that every leader, every leader, whether in a business or a church or a family or a community, this is a question that every leader must honestly ask. What is my motive? Am I seeking leadership or positions of influence for my own benefit? Or am I humbly leading and living for the applause of my heavenly Father? This is the motive Paul models for us of Christian leadership. I just love this um, about Paul, and it's so striking to me. Um, His desire, his motive was to please God, not simply the applause of the crowd. Uh, But notice something else he says here at the end of this verse. This just jumped out at me this week. He says, we are not trying to please people, but God who, and he uses this word, tests our hearts. And this word test could also be translated examines. It's kind of that picture. Remember the prayer of the psalmist David when he says, search my heart, O God. Test my heart. Examine me. Put me under the microscope, God. Tell me where there's cavities in my character. And one of the things I love about Lake Forest is our model of church governance. Some of you, if you've been through our Welcome 101 class, will remember we're Presbyterian, but we say we're Presbyterian with a lowercase p. What that means is that we are actually led by elders. We are an elder-led church. That's what the word presbytos means. It means elder in Greek. And yes, while I am responsible as the lead pastor here for the vision and for the teaching of our church, I am also accountable to the elders of our church, and they accountable to one another. The men and women who serve as elders here do so because they were recommended based on their character, their love of Jesus, their evidence of serving and shepherding in the life of the church. They go through a nine-month examination process. 
And they really practice mutual submission to one another on our elder team. I just love how this structure serves to keep us close to this model of leadership that Jesus calls us to, that Paul models for us. First thing we need to examine in our leadership is our motives. Are we seeking God's approval or the applause of many? Which brings me to our second item, which is the method, the method, Paul's method, namely that he uses influence and not power. Influence and not power. What do I mean? Well, again, this is so striking to me, and it really reminds me of Jesus. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in the next verse. He says, you know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for, the pra- for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though, here it is, as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Do you see what Paul's saying here? He could have played the power card. He could have played the apostle card. He could have come in power, but he doesn't. Instead, he comes in humility and vulnerability. And this is so huge. So many folks in our world today rely on power, coercive power, positional power. But as all of the leadership research points out, power never leads to lasting change. Power may achieve a temporary compliance, but it does not lead to real change. I love how Timothy Keller, pastor in New York, puts it. He says, power is compliance by external force, but influence is a voluntary response through internal resonance. It's a powerful statement. And Paul understood this. Paul didn't come on some kind of power trip. He came gently and relationally because his goal was not power and compliance. His goal was influence. He wanted to lead people to Jesus. And he knew that this must be done relationally, earning the right to be heard through his genuine care of others. Notice what he says in the next verse. He says it this way. Just as a, what an interesting metaphor, nursing mother. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. See, what Paul shows us here is that Christian leadership is always about relationship and not just rhetoric. This is such a model for real discipleship and influence in God's economy. Real influence is always relational influence. And in today's world, there is no shortage of good rhetoric. There's no shortage of good Christian content. In fact, you can get way better preaching this afternoon if you want just by logging onto YouTube, right? That's just kind of the reality. (laughs) But God's design for the life of his church And the way of spiritual growth that we see in the scriptures is always one of relationships, of sharing our hearts and our lives together. It's one of the primary reasons why we need the church. We talked about this last week, doing the just me and Jesus thing. That's okay for a time, but that doesn't really cut it. You might gain some head knowledge. You might gain some encouragement, but you will only grow in your character. You will only grow in the image of of Jesus. You will only grow in your gifts when you are doing life in a community of faith, as imperfect as that community might be. And we see this in Paul's double metaphor in this passage. First, he says he loved them like a mother, a nursing mother. Got a feel for that? This doesn't mean that fathers don't love. Okay, fathers love. We know you get up in the middle of the night too. Yes, yes, right? He's just emphasizing something here. He's emphasizing the tenderness and the compassion of a mom caring for her nursing infant. Do you get that? Jesus uses the same imagery when he talks about how he longed to gather his children under his wings like a mother hen. Same imagery. When we are leading others, when we are shepherding others, we would do well to ask ourselves, am I caring for those I'm leading with this kind of tender love? Am I? But notice, Paul doesn't stop there. He uses a second image, and I love this. He says, uh, that of a father encouraging, comforting, and urging. There is still compassion, but there is this image of a parent, a father who is appropriately challenging, calling out the best in the child, supporting them in their growth. You can do it. Keep going. Don't quit. The truth is, we need both, don't we? 
We need spiritual mothers and we need spiritual fathers. We need to be both. We need to be both grace and truth. And we need both of these in the church. Love and challenge, care and encouragement. These always go together. I remember one time uh, in ministry, this is not at this church, this is at a church in California. I was over all of the small group leaders and I was doing a training and a woman came to the small group training and she sat through all eight hours. We trained, it was, it was an extensive training. And uh, we got to the very end and I had a Q&A and she raised her hand and, and then with gritted teeth she said, Aaron, when do I get to tell them the truth in love? I said, never. Never is the answer to that question. You never get to tell them. The truth. She, she did not understand. She wanted to only bring truth. She wanted to only bring challenge. She was missing the nurture. The power. We need both. Do you see what I mean here? Not a helpful example, the gritted teeth leader, was it? All right. You guys getting a feel. We need both. Without truth and encouragement, we will never grow into the shape and image of Jesus. We'll always walk with a limp. How would people characterize your leadership? Do they experience both truth and love from you? If you were to reflect on how others experience you, what might be lacking? First, we need to pay attention to a leader's motives. Why am I doing this? Who am I trying to please? Secondly, a leader's method. Is it relational? Is it both truth and love, truth and grace? And then third and finally, we see a leader's mission. Paul's mission was very, very clear. As a leader, Paul had one mission. It was to see people formed into disciples of Christ. Look with me at the last verse of chapter 2. He says this. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? What's our hope? What's What's our goal? What's our aim? Is it not you, he says? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. And again, do you see how remarkable this is? And quite honestly, inspirational. Paul's goal is not his own fame. It's not his own name or his own notoriety, but the growth of people under his leadership. You know, as a church, we have to measure a lot of things around here. We do, right? We just kind of, we're kind of run, there's a part of this, it's running a business. And we have to measure things like how many kids are in the Kid Venture program at 9.15 on a Sunday morning. And the answer is a lot, a lot, right? <laughs> in fact, if you want to sign up to be a Kid Venture guide, we would love to talk with you today. <laughs> We have to measure things like how many parking spots are full. That's what we've been doing these last couple weeks. And we were like, this isn't working. We've got to make some adjustments, right? We we measure those things. We measure things like our giving. uh, And are we on track for the budget this year? And the answer is yes. You guys are doing an amazing job with your generosity, investing in the mission of Lake Forest. We measure all these things because we want to be good stewards. We want to be good managers of the resources that God has given us, to be as effective as we can. But... If you were to ask us as a church, if you were to ask our elders about how we measure success, do you know what they would say? They would answer it with two words, God stories, God stories. That's how we measure our success, just like the one we heard today, just like John's story. Stories of life change, stories of people putting their faith and trust in Jesus, stories of healed relationships, stories of courageous love or remarkable generosity. These stories of discipleship, these stories of God at work is our true measure of success at Lake Forest. As we love people, as they discover and live out their role in God's story, that's how we measure success. And Paul is inviting us to let this be the goal of our leadership and influence as well. That you, that we as one another might be shaped into the image of Jesus. This is our theme throughout the book. Follow me as I follow Christ, says Paul. Follow me. Imitate me as I imitate Jesus, just as others will imitate you. So how are we to respond to all this? How are we to respond to this challenging chapter? This is This is a tricky chapter, right? There's some stuff going on here Paul's trying to walk through. And we see his motive, his methods, his his mission. What What are we to do? How are we to live in the middle of a broken world, especially when we experience that brokenness inside the church too? I want to end just with these three things. First, 
I think we need to be honest about our own church hurt. Honest about our church hurt. A lot of us have been hurt. Well, a lot of us have been disillusioned by the church, right? Some of us have contributed to church hurt. <laughs> Maybe all of us. We need to be able to talk about this with a trusted friend or mentor. Please hear me carefully on this. God is not asking you to pretend away the sin of another person. He is not. God does not need you to protect his reputation. It is secure. And though healing and forgiveness is always a journey, it begins with being honest about our hurt and disappointment. And if you've never begun that path, you, you may need to do so. If you want to experience healing and forgiveness and growth. Truth is, the church is full of people. And we are, are not, so, excuse me, let me put this. Church, truth is, the church is full of people. <laughs> and we are all not just capable of being hurt, but of hurting others too. And so it's important to recognize the ways that we've contributed to church hurt, the way we have experienced church hurt, and to be honest about that. Secondly, I want us to remember that just me and Jesus, which I did that first season of my life. Too. I, man, I gave up on church. I was not coming back. I did the just me and Jesus. And that's not bad. That's good, especially when you're wrestling with the church. Don't let your wrestling with the church cause you to give up on faith in Jesus. That is not worth it. But at some point, as you re-engage, just me and Jesus will not be enough. We need others if we're really going to grow in faith and love and to become more like Jesus. Remember last week, we are all imitating someone. And so be wise in who you follow and who you look to for guidance in your spiritual maturity. Do they have pure motives? Are they seeking God's approval and not the applause of people? And do they offer genuine relationship and not just rhetoric? Are they the kind of leaders that Paul models? Finally, thirdly, remember that you are also someone others are looking to. And it's here that I think we finally come to the hope today. The truth is there are others looking to you. For a group of people in your world, you are the leader. You are the model of what it means to be a Christian. In your workplace, on your baseball team, in your neighborhood, at your gym, in your family. And what do others see when they look at you as a leader? Are you someone seeking God's approval? rather than popularity? Are you someone living for an audience of one? Are you someone offering your heart and your life in real relationship with others the way Paul did, with genuine love and appropriate challenge? How are they experiencing you? You see, even though we are living in the middle of two resurrections, the brokenness, hurt, and sin are still a part of the story. But we can help to write and tell a different story. As we follow the example of Paul and model our lives on Jesus, we can become the kind of community that points to the faith, hope, and love that we have in Jesus. And his promise that one day he will return to restore and heal and renew all things can give us the courage to lead by his example, including his deeply loved community in the church that he is coming one day, his bride, to restore. So how will you be a part of that new story? How will you lead? What will others see when they look at you as a model of what it means to follow Jesus? Can we pray? Oh, Father, today I just open my heart to you. I open my life to you. Pray that you would search me and see if there be any ill will in me, any way that is not straight and right. And would your grace, once again, restore me. God, this is a hard word for us as a church. It's a hard time to follow you. Would you give us the strength by your Holy Spirit to trust you, to model our lives on you, Jesus? the one who did not cling to his power for his own advantage, but humbled himself, becoming a servant and sacrificing out of love. Jesus, would you form us into the kind of community that could be a place of healing and restoring? And would people always look at us 
and see not us, but you, Jesus. We pray all this in your righteous and holy name. Amen. Well, let's stand one more time and sing to this Jesus, to this author, the perfecter of our faith, to this picture of grace. Let's sing. There is a bomb in Gilead, the mending work of the Father's hands. And there is a Christ who gave it all, who bled and died to save my soul.
What good news to end on today with this challenging word from the apostle, right? As we just, sometimes you get to read the Bible, sometimes the Bible reads you. (laughs) And this morning, we were kind of read by this letter. But here's the good news. He is a God who heals. (laughs) There's a balm in Gilead. And he can heal even those hurts and those wounds if we allow him into those spaces to do that. But also, that we have the opportunity to be part of a different story. We get to live as spiritual mothers and fathers with tenderness and love and compassion. We get to be uh, spiritual harpers to others around us, encouraging, uplifting. Do you get that? That's the invitation. And can you imagine, can you imagine what God might do with one little community of his followers as we embody Harper's kind of encouragement, that kind of tenderness and love? We're going to continue next week in Thessalonians with chapter 3. I hope you're reading along with us. It's going to be a fun journey. Can I give us a blessing as we go? And now may the grace and peace of God the Father, the grace and love of God the Son, and the grace and nearness of God the Spirit be yours today, this week, and forever, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks for being here, guys. We'll see you all next week. Don't forget your kids.